Appeal to nature is in human nature in the modern world because there is often an appeal to denature to continue the modern world of question and confusion. People can see the outright fakery in the world and they ought not to ignore it or make excuses for it, but rather tell it for what it is, fake and thus unnatural and indeed thus wrong to be. I defend appeal to nature only in its knowledgeable form of knowing what nature is so that the appeal is just and not incomplete or incoherent. Companies that use appeal to nature are only referring to the absence of artificial aspects or they just appeal to people who think what is natural is healthy, for example. People do know what is natural is generally healthy instinctually since it's supposed to be something closer to nature or more nature derived. Not that they ever truly know for sure or that they can define what is natural. As you may notice, there's context and not a simply cut plain dry equation to the appeal to nature. People will claim that there isn't some one nature or that nature is perceived differently, but evidently natural law is objective, just as human nature is objective. Everything has natures of its own that can be understood, and is only growing in its understanding. We can learn from the objective realities and do our best to align our free will action based on our mindset. Natural law governs the morality of our actions, the consequences to our behavior. It is an aspect of nature to which, when forgotten or unknown, we are detached from nature by way of our connection through harmonization of understanding of nature. We are destined for this knowledge of morality, for optimal survivability and peace, and our human nature of the human brain neocortex permits such. If we speak of no objective consequences to man-made things, we fail to come to understand the intended blueprint of life. We think we be can become nature instead of respecting and acknowledging what is of nature. After all, it is science to say every unknown can be known. And when we realize something is of nature and with a nature of its own, we may make the appeal to such to further ground our understanding our knowledge of truth as to understanding what it is and is not, including if it is to be or if not to be, due to also the nature of its impacts. Nature speaks at every level and thus an appeal to nature can be justly made everywhere when knowledge is applied. What is natural is good as it is preferable to what isn't, if it's truly natural, this requires knowledge. What is natural can be bad, that is dependent in its nature. Anything in nature can be used for bad. This, again, requires knowledge. What is natural by itself as an item or object versus an action are two separate scenarios, all asking the question of nature's intention, otherwise known as studying truth, finding the knowledge. Nothing is inherently unnatural and everything is inherently natural. Things can only remain or try to be maintained in being natural or become more denatured, thus more unnatural via denaturing. It's a matter of focus or manifestation toward nature or away from nature. And thus, if there lives a society utilizing the appeal to nature often, although it may not always be knowledgeable, you bet that society is more detached from nature, yet still technically living in nature, and thus they seek the return by way of recognition, acknowledgement, simplistics, common sense, self-governance, or even God. People have this appeal for good reason not to be ignored even without knowledge although knowledge is recommended to make the more truthful appeal. The appeal to nature can be done, and it always will be done. It's just a matter of if we recognize the importance in nature to begin with. The appeal to nature doesn't end scientific exploration. It seeks intention and intuition, which those of the scientific left brain may not want to seek out. The appeal to denature is the real culprit of man giving excuse to dominion over nature, grown out of the lack of care for the real appeal to nature. It may state that because what is natural is often wrong and imperfect, man shall fix and make perfect those wrongs with his own creation.
With any appeal or argument, always seek the why, else the appeal or argument will not be backed by knowledge. And all this is how you understand the real appeal to nature, which works with nature that most people generally strive for, versus the unknowledgeable appeal to nature, which most people generally have, versus the appeal to denature, which the authoritarian left brain permits. The double ladder of which are counterintuitive. For much of the left brain imbalance, knowing natural law can be of great help, so that our intuition and intellect may form our mental intelligence on the matter of and for any appeal or action we take in life. Not only this, but endless semantic debates matter not in the face of objectivity in law. naturalistic fallacy is that what is ought to be. The appeal to nature is that what is natural, as in not man-made, is good and that which isn't is bad. You get this all the time from woo peddlers. This product is natural, so obviously it's much better than that crap someone made in a laboratory. Premise 1, X is natural. Premise 2, that which is natural is good. Conclusion, therefore X is good. Premise 2 is false. Nature isn't good or bad, it just is. Naturally, humans are hunter-gatherers, but with agriculture we get access to much more food than without it. And if you think agriculture is natural, you clearly haven't looked at how plants grow in the wild compared to how they grow in our fields. It's not natural for plants to grow in monocultures the way they do in fields. Such monocultures can't be sustained without active effort to remove undesired plants, commonly referred to as weeds. So clearly this whole agriculture thing can't be good, right? I mean, just look at what happened to the human population after the agricultural revolution. It absolutely skyrocketed. Oh, wait. Similar population growths accompanied the inventions of more efficient farming methods, antibiotics, vaccines, and the introduction of indoor plumbing, which allows for better hygiene. Look, nature isn't like in Disney movies. As I alluded to earlier, this fallacy is used all the time as a marketing ploy. 100% natural is used as a selling point. Dude, arsenic is 100% natural. Of course, other terms are also used for the exact same purpose, like organic and chemical-free. Organic in this context is a horrible misnomer. Organic means carbon-based. There's no such thing as non-organic plants or non-organic meat. The term is literally used to mean natural or this product has been produced using inefficient methods that are less cost effective and often worse for the environment. And no, it's not healthier either. People demand products like this because they believe they're healthier simply because they're produced using less efficient and thus more natural methods. As for chemical-free, that's on the list of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Everything you've ever eaten has been made of nothing but chemicals. But people think the word chemical means a poison added by an evil scientist in a laboratory to turn frogs gay or something like that. A chemical is a substance made up of atoms. All the matter you interact with is made up of chemicals. Remember that whenever someone tries to sell you chemical-free salt. If there are no chemicals in it, then there's no salt in it either. If the point is to sell pure salt, then that term should be used instead. Chemical-free is just used to appeal to people who think chemicals are unnatural and thus bad. to nature is the belief that whatever comes from nature is beneficial and helpful and cannot possibly harm you. Uh, the evidence, however, points to the fact that not everything that comes from nature is safe, 
not everything that comes from nature is good for you and many of the human made or artificial objects that we consume on the daily basis are completely safe and highly beneficial. To someone who has been alienated from nature by the modern capitalist conditions we live in, it is pretty easy to fall to appeal to nature fallacy because we feel that we have been separated from nature so now we want to go back to it and now we perceive everything that comes from it as great and it's hard for us to see the full picture and the full picture is nature is neither inherently good or bad because nature is a human construct whatever exists in the world cannot be defined by a single term and we people have made the term nature for ease and we like to personify things so personifying nature as our collective mother has been helpful to many of us in our understanding of nature and the natural occurrences going back to greenwashing Greenwashing is a marketing ploy that is used to convince people that the products that are made with nature in mind or that are made from natural, organic components are somehow superior to artificial, man-made products. <laughs> and um, there might be some truth to that in some cases there is evidence that usually not much difference can be found between artificial and natural components because we humans do take our materials for creating whatever it is we need from nature and i'm not talking obviously about some some more modern technologies which i'm not too familiar with i'm going to try and not over generalize too much but greenwashing is harmful because it plays on someone's feelings it manipulates one into believing that this product with the label natural on it is um, worth buying and oftentimes it is priced much more highly than the regular product that is very comparable to the one offered so i used to think that it was true <laughs> And I used to try and buy the products that were labeled as green and clean and natural. And I have been disappointed because by comparing the ingredients of those supposedly natural and good for you products to the regular products available on the market, I was proven to be wrong. And I have wasted my resources because of this marketing ploy and some of those products that i consumed thinking that they were natural therefore they could not possibly harm you actually harmed me <laughs> and uh, again i was so frustrated with the fact that those businesses that promoted their products didn't actually care to explain what those components were and how they were supposed to affect one's body and I felt cheated. I felt that I have been manipulated into using something that wasn't even properly studied. And I've also felt like a guinea pig. So greenwashing alongside with the appeal to nature fallacy are a form of emotional bias. So we should always watch out for it because when our feelings are concerned, we can't fully trust them because they change very quickly and they're not a reliable source of data. So we should always double check what it is we're consuming. We should always question ourselves why we're consuming one thing over the other. And we should question our choices and what influences our choices. Because sometimes it may be the specifically targeted ad that makes us feel a certain way. And we may chase that feeling and it may actually occur for a while. We may feel good about ourselves for being green and not consuming anything artificial, but ultimately it's not gonna last. At least it's highly unlikely that it's gonna last. Have you ever heard someone say that something is healthy simply because it's natural or that something is unhealthy because it's unnatural?
If you have, then you've heard one of the most common mistakes in reasoning. While it may at first seem like a legitimate way of thinking about the world, saying that something is good for you simply because it's natural, or not good for you because it's unnatural, has some very big logical pitfalls. For starters, it's not exactly clear how to separate the natural from the unnatural, and the concept of being natural is much more vague than one would initially think. To see what I mean by this, consider wearing clothes. Is it natural for people to wear clothes? Or consider the technology of fire. Is it natural to use fire to cook our food? To me, it isn't exactly obvious that there are good answers to these questions. Even if we set this aside, however, it's not that hard to find objects in nature that violate the idea that what is natural is good for you. There are many plants and animals, for example, that are poisonous if you eat them. Also, if you smoke tobacco or get too much sunlight from being outside, then you might get cancer. Yet, all the things I just mentioned fit any reasonable definition of what it means to be natural. We can also think of objects that are unnatural, such as glasses which help the seeing impaired see, or sunscreen which blocks out natural sunlight and prevents skin cancer, that any reasonable person would conclude are good for you. Please note what I'm not saying here is that something is unhealthy because it is natural, or healthy because it isn't natural. What I'm saying here is the status of something's naturalness does not determine if it is healthy or good. If we want to figure this out to the best of our abilities, then we must examine the evidence. In science studies and in the philosophy of science, we have a term that isn't widely known outside of a certain narrow usage, but which I think is useful. It's an inference pattern known as a double induction. Don't worry if you haven't heard of this, it's not standard usage. But here's the pattern. In studying some domain of nature, I bring some ideological or social worldview to bear, and I project that worldview onto what I'm studying. So I see this worldview reflected in the nature that I'm studying. That's the first induction. And then I turn around and say, look, our belief system is confirmed by nature itself. Our way of life is justified because it's natural. It reflects the natural order. That's the second induction. We use the observations of nature to rationalize the ideology that we projected onto our descriptions of nature in the first place. A classic example is British Victorian England with its monarchy and rigid class structure. Natural historians studying beehives would draw pictures of the social organization of bees that almost perfectly reproduce the monarchy and class system with a single queen bee, worker bees, drone bees, and so on. And then they could point at it and say, look, see, hierarchy and monarchy is natural. It's the way that industrious creatures were designed by God to fulfill their potential. There are lots of examples like this. With the rise of capitalism and a Darwinian survival of the fittest ideology, scientists started to pay more attention to competition among species in nature and the culling of the unfit as a primary mechanism of evolution. Social theorists then used these seemingly objective scientific descriptions of nature to support a Darwinian view of human society and social progress, and to justify programs of population control and selective breeding to reduce undesirable qualities in human populations. This kind of thinking can happen anywhere. On the political left, for those who were inspired by Marx and Engels' 19th century philosophy of dialectical materialism, there's a conception of nature there that's built into that worldview. When you're studying the natural world, you need to be on the lookout for biases that can creep in due to one's philosophical or ideological worldview. Now, to some extent, this is inevitable, but it's particularly concerning if you're appealing to science to tell you what's natural and then conclude that some particular social order that you happen to prefer is natural and therefore justified. People have found justifications for almost every social practice this way. Science tells us that slavery is natural, racial discrimination is natural, fixed gender roles are natural, colonialism is natural, hierarchy is natural, free market capitalism is natural, communism is natural. This is a seductive path. You don't want to find yourself projecting your ideology onto the science and then using that same science to justify your ideology.
reasoning is invalid because it's possible for the premises of the argument to be true and the conclusion false. Something can be natural but bad for you, and something can be unnatural but good for you. So let me give you a bunch of quick examples. Hurricanes and tornadoes, these are all natural things, but they're certainly terrible for you and your home. Or arsenic, lead, radon gas, hemlock, different kinds of poison ivy. All of these things are, again, natural, but they're terrible for your body. An example of something that's artificial or not natural but good for you would just be medicines. Uh, but you could also look at a variety of other technologies. You might wear glasses. These glasses are good for you in the sense that they allow you to see, but there's nothing natural about the pair of glasses or spectacles you wear. A lot of the examples you see where individuals commit the appealing to nature fallacy, what individuals will do is simply say, something is natural, therefore that thing is good. But there are more subtle forms of this appealing to nature fallacy. A less subtle but still pretty blatant one is just calling something organic, saying this thing is organic, therefore this thing is good for you or better than some non-organic alternative. Now, it may be good for you, but it has nothing to do with the fact that it's organic. Take an example of American Spirit cigarettes. On some boxes of American Spirit cigarettes, it says made with 100% organic tobacco. Now, does this imply that it's better than non-organic tobacco? Maybe, maybe in fact it is. But it's wrong to reason from the fact that this thing is organic to the fact that it's better for you than some other non-organic alternative. Now, some even more subtle examples have to do with associations of things with nature. So I love this example from Chesterfield Cigarettes, and they say that their cigarettes are better than alternatives because the tobacco is sun-drenched. Sun-drenched hot tobacco is gonna mean that you're smoking smoother and you're smoking clean. In calling the tobacco sun-drenched, you get this idea of, in your mind of the sun shining on the tobacco, its association with nature, and therefore that this particular tobacco is healthier for you or better for you than some alternative. Another example involves Salem cigarettes. In one particular commercial, they associate Salem cigarettes with springtime, and that when you smoke these cigarettes, you are breathing in fresh, cool springtime air. The gentle sounds of springtime seem to say relax and be refreshed. And just as gently, Salem brings you springtime refreshment. For Salem special paper, air softens every puff, breathes in fresh, cool air. Again, we have an association with some aspect of nature. Springtime, cool, fresh air, the dew on the ground with something else. And so the claim is that these Salem cigarettes are natural or have this association with nature, and therefore they're better than some alternative. In both the case of the Chesterfield cigarettes as well as the Salem cigarettes, no one ever actually says nature. Instead, there is a kind of conjuring or indirect reference to nature. Here's another example. Some individuals argue that more minimalistic running shoes promote a greater degree of natural foot motion, and more natural foot motion is good. Good in the sense that it reduces the likelihood of running-related injuries. So here we have an association between how it's natural for us to run and that thing being good for us. Another example, it wasn't until 1984 that women were permitted to run in the Olympic marathon. The reasoning went something as follows. It's unnatural for women to run long distances. They weren't made to do this. Therefore, it's bad for them. It's harmful for them to run long distances. Therefore, we should keep women from running long distances. The race director wrote back and said, women are not physiologically able to run 26 miles or to run a marathon, and we can't take the medical liability. At the time, I was, riding, I was running 40 miles at a stretch. So this, again, is an appealing to nature fallacy because something is at least thought to be unnatural for women. Therefore, they shouldn't do it. Another example relates to childbirth. Now, there's a couple of versions of this argument sometimes given. One involves just pointing to the fact that it's natural for women to give birth. Another involves that they have the natural capacity to give birth. So one version might be, well, since women have the natural capacity to be birth, therefore it's good for them to give birth. And even further, an individual might argue that they ought to be having babies. Again, this is an appealing to nature fallacy. Just because something is natural or an individual has the natural capacity to do something doesn't mean that they are morally obligated to do so nor does it mean that it's prudentially good for them to do so. Where do you draw the line as to what's, what's good that's unnatural and what's bad that's natural? Or something. Anyway. The appeal to nature fallacy is one of those things where once you know about it, you start seeing it everywhere. It's really simple, too. 
The word unnatural has one definition that means artificial or not occurring in nature, and one definition that means evil or perverse. The word natural also has multiple definitions, one of which is found in nature and the other one is instinctively right. The appeal to nature fallacy just sort of whistles nonchalantly and substitutes one definition for the other, trying to convince you that something is right or wrong because it is or isn't found in nature. Firstly, just because something's artificial doesn't make it bad. Computers aren't bad. Toilet paper isn't bad. Antibiotics and space exploration and laws and literature and YouTube aren't bad, and they're all really unnatural. Secondly, and this is the one that bugs me the most, just because something is found in nature or is an innate urge in humans doesn't make it good or justify it. Nature is full of things that we really don't like a lot. Disease is natural. Death is natural. Skin cancer and poisonous mushrooms are natural. Also, animals kill and maim and rape and torture each other without good reason. A lot of people seem to think that animals are sort of pure and free from malice, but Bear in mind that every lolcat that you see on the internet will play with a wounded mouse for hours on end before finally putting it out of its misery. And those are just animals that we keep as pets. Some primates like chimpanzees will raid neighboring groups of chimps just to murder their children. Also, there's some evidence that female ducks have evolved specialized genitalia to prevent them from being raped because duck rape is absurdly common. So it's pretty obvious after some thought that supposedly natural things aren't necessarily better than supposedly unnatural things. That doesn't stop a lot of really terrible arguments being made based on those grounds. I'm going to point out three types. One of these arguments goes like this. Well, of course humans do terrible things to each other. It's how evolution programmed us. It's the natural order of things. Ugh, this is used a lot to explain things like bullying and rape because apparently they're natural urges and so we shouldn't get worked up about them. This isn't just an appeal to nature fallacy claiming that because hurting each other is natural, it's okay. It's also factually inaccurate. A lot of animals don't do these things to each other and there is no evidence to show that humans have an innate urge to do any of them. Like if you leave a baby in the woods, it has precisely one instinct. It will cry loudly until something comes to eat it. Also, even if we did have other natural instincts, they're not the primary drives of our behavior. We managed to potty train ourselves at a pretty young age and that's as far from the call of nature as you can get. Another argument based on the appeal to nature is something that you find in a lot of advertising. The next time you go to a supermarket or a pharmacy or even your bathroom, check to see how the products are marketed. You'll notice that they usually only have one of two marketing techniques on the box. Either they're miracles of science and technology or, you guessed it, they're all natural. It's really pretty amazing how many bathroom products have leaves on the bottle and claim to be all natural. I mean, they might be, but it's not going to get your hair any cleaner. Finally, and this is the really annoying one, people will use the appeal to nature to push ethics and behavior. You should have your baby without any drugs or an epidural. It's more natural. Bonobos are some of our closest evolutionary relatives, and they're not monogamous, so humans shouldn't be monogamous either. This herbal remedy is better for you. It's all natural. The way we live our lives these days is just unnatural. We should get back to nature. Bestiality is contrary to nature and an abomination. Marijuana is just a plant, unlike other drugs. It's natural, so we shouldn't ban it. Of course, discussions about whether particular phenomena are, or are not, naturally occurring are valid and can be interesting. But whether something is natural or not is irrelevant to whether it is a good or bad thing, where many so-called alternative therapies boast that they work with the body's natural healing potential, or return us to our natural state of balance. Herbal remedies often claim to have no side effects because they are naturally occurring. Various lifestyles are also promoted through appeals to nature. Veganism or vegetarianism are sometimes claimed to be more natural, as are contradictory diets like the paleo diet. A reduction in technology and a return to more self-sufficient or off-grid lifestyles are also promoted as returning to nature, suggesting that being with nature is inherently better for us. The other area where the appeal to nature fallacy is often used is when discussing morality. Despite it being fairly obvious that what is natural is not always good, this is still a fairly common appeal to nature fallacy. So, opponents of social change often equate the way things are with what is natural, and then appeal to nature to argue that any change is bad. Such arguments have been made against homosexuality, marriage equality, women's right to vote, interracial marriage, and the abolition of slavery, to list only a few. Similar arguments are made to defend antisocial behaviour, like sexual assault or violence, since such actions occur naturally. Needless to say, the fact that such urges may be natural in no way implies that they are necessarily good. 
In conclusion, the appeal to nature fallacy is when something is taken to be good because it is natural. One runs the risk of being dismissed as an advocate for one large appeal to nature fallacy. Today, I'd like to discuss how this is not a valid criticism. The problem with the appeal to nature fallacy is not in the conclusion, but in the premises. Examples of these fallacies either assume incorrectly that natural entails good, or fail to properly define what natural means, or at times both. In the case of our soap brand, they really fail to do either. In their case, the former is an underlying assumption, and the latter is the assumption that a bar of soap that has easier to pronounce ingredients is more quote unquote natural. They do all of this because they want consumers to believe that the bar is good or better than the alternatives and fall for the appeal to nature fallacy. Now, while Taoism is not a product on the market, it still runs the risk of being misinterpreted as an example of an appeal to nature fallacy. When Zhuangzi tells Huizhi of the sage, he just lets things be the way they are and doesn't try to help life long. Huizhi may retort stating that that's just an example of an appeal to nature fallacy. But to do so would be to ignore large sums of preaching Taoist thought. Taoism is a system of ideas to ancient China beginning with Lao Tzu's work known as the Tao Te Ching. Unlike Confucianism, Taoism was interested in the people's relation to nature, and much less to each other. It found people unnecessarily at odds with nature and their personal interests and pursuits. To counteract this, Taoism advocated that people should live in accordance with nature. It often advised that people should do what is natural. This rings similar to the appeal to nature fallacy, but where Taoism departs is in the backing of the claims. An appeal to nature is only a fallacy so long as its premises are false and unfounded. Taoism avoids both of the faults of an appeal to nature fallacy those being to either fail to properly define what natural means or to assume incorrectly that natural entails good. First, Taoism articulates what is natural through the use of two concepts, Wu Wei and Zutran. Wu Wei, here understood as non-effort or action through non-action, is what happens when man discards his personal interests and knowledge, thereby acting naturally, or to use a colloquialism going with the flow. It is for man to get out of his own way and embrace that which comes naturally. Zityan is the other side of the coin, Wu Wei's counterpart. It itself is often translated as natural, naturally so, or of its own accord. In the Zhuangzi, he who exemplified both of these concepts was the true man. The true man of ancient times did not rebel against want, did not grow proud in plenty, and did not plan his affairs. The 38th chapter of the Tao Te Ching asserts our first premise, that natural is better, or in this case, more virtuous. Where it is written, a man of the highest virtue never acts, yet leaves nothing undone. A man of the lowest virtue acts, but there are things left undone. And in the 18th chapter of the Zhuangzi, it is written that, I take non-action to be true happiness, but ordinary people think it's a bitter thing. In one case, the natural is taken to be of higher virtue, while in the other it is taken to be higher happiness. But in both cases, Wu Wei and Zutran, along with it, are preferable. We can see that pre Chin Taoists argue for the first premise, and that the texts they wrote have no lack of supporting examples. In the Tao Te Ching, it is suggested that a sage ruler who rules through Wu Wei, or non action, and allows things to take their own course, will lead to the ideal nation. The 57th chapter says Use the expected to govern the country, use surprise to wage war, use non action to win the world. How do I know this? Like this. The more prohibitions and rules, the poorer the people become. The sharper people's weapons, the more they riot. The more skilled their techniques, the more grotesque their works. The more elaborate the laws, the more they commit crimes. Therefore the sage says, I do nothing, and people transform themselves. I enjoy serenity, and people govern themselves. I cultivate emptiness, and people become prosperous. I have no desire, and people simplify themselves. In the Zhuangzi, it is suggested in a number of places that skill is a product of acting naturally, or along with nature. There is a story of the swimmer whose abilities are so outstanding that he can swim where no fish can, yet all he does is follow his nature. Confucius was seeing the sights of Lu Liang, 
where the water falls from a height of 30 fathoms and races and boils along for 40 li, so swift that no fish or other water creature can swim in it. He saw a man dive into the water and, supposing that the man was in some kind of trouble and intended to end his life, he ordered his disciples to line up on the bank and pull the man out. But after the man had gone a couple of hundred paces, he came out of the water and began strolling along the base of the embankment, his hair streaming down, singing a song. Confucius ran after him and said, At first I thought you were a ghost, but now I see you're a man. May I ask if you have some special way of staying afloat in the water? He responded, I have no way. I began with what I was used to, grew up with my nature, and let things come to completion with fate. I go under with the swirls and come out with the eddies, following along the way the water goes and never thinking about myself. That's how I can stay afloat. Confucius said, what do you mean by saying that you began with what you were used to, grew up with your nature, and let things come to completion with fate? He responded, I was born on the dry land and felt safe on the dry land. That was what I was used to. I grew up with water and felt safe in the water. That was my nature. I do not know why I do what I do. That's fate. Both classics utilize the wisdom of the ancients to demonstrate how man acted at the time before excessive human interference. In the Tao Te Ching, chapter 15, translated by John C. H. Wu, it is written, The ancient adepts of the Tao were subtle and flexible, profound and comprehensive. Their minds were too deep to be fathomed. Because they are unfathomable, one can only describe them vaguely by their appearance. Hesitant, like one wading a stream in winter. Timid, like one afraid of his neighbors on all sides. Cautious and courteous, like a guest. Yielding, like ice on the point of melting. Simple, like an uncarved block. Hollow, like a cave. Confused, like a muddy pool. And it's not a mistake that their characteristics are often analogous to nature. In the Zhuangzi, translated by James Liege, it's written, The man of old, while the chaotic condition was yet undeveloped, shared the placid tranquility which belonged to the whole world. At that time, the yin and yang were harmonious and still. Their resting and movement proceeded without any disturbance. The four seasons had their definite times, not a single thing received an injury, and no living being came to a premature end. Men might be possessed of the faculty of knowledge, but they had no occasion for its use. This was what is called the state of perfect unity. At this time, there was no action on the part of anyone, but a constant manifestation of spontaneity. All of these examples serve to prove our first premise, that the natural is preferable in the Tao Te Ching, virtuous, and in the Zhuangzi, happiness. And in the end, Taoism does not fall victim to the appeal to nature fallacy. Instead, it strengthens the same argumentative structure through proving the premises to create a sound appeal to nature. check in on forums or something or read some YouTube comments, many people will say, there's nothing new here. I've heard this before somewhere else. Uh, this person covers this. I've read this in this book. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have news for you. There is nothing new here. I am not going to present anything new. I am not going to present anything that has not actually been in existence and will continue to be in existence. I'm not making up new material. I, I call myself, I, I would refer to myself, Art uh, said it the other day, actually uh, yesterday when we were having dinner. He, he said, I consider you an aggregator of material. And I love that term. I, I, I love that description of what I do. I, I am an aggregator. I bring things together into a tapestry and then help to explain it in simple and easy to understand terms so that people can readily absorb it, take it in, and then do something with that information. So you will not be seeing or hearing anything new here today, okay? As the old saying goes in, in, in all of the old mystery traditions, there is nothing new under the sun. And what that phrase actually means, many people don't know what that phrase means. It means that the truth, it, it is singular and eternal, 
Truth has always been here among us, and it will always be, be here. It is our perception that must be aligned with it. What definition is? It is all related to clarity. When we use it in conjunction with words, it means the clarity of the meaning is amplified. Okay? And when it's with a picture, the clarity of our vision, of the ability to see what the picture is, what the information in the picture is amplified. And same thing with sound. The more accurate the definitions that we have for words or concepts, the better our clarity of meaning and therefore our understanding of those concepts, words or concepts will be. So definition simply means clarity of meaning when we're applying it to words and concepts. So therefore, let's define natural law. So this is what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the day. We have to define it. <clears throat> the simple definition of natural is inherent, having a basis in nature, reality, and truth not made or caused by humankind. So if it's natural, wasn't made by man. Mankind didn't make it. Okay? And again, the origin of the word, neter in Egyptian, means spirit, and all means of or related to. So of or related to spirit. Mm -hmm. So let's look at the worldview schism that goes hand in hand with the brain schism or the mental schism. And th again, this is worldview is exactly what it says. How do you view the world? How do you view yourself in it? How do you view others in it? Well, when there's chronic left brain dominance, the worldview that emerges is one of randomness. And again, this is a hallmark of scientism. The world is this grand cosmic accident, all right? The whole universe is a grand accident. There's no purpose, right? It, there's no creator. Everything just ma magically manifested on its own for no reason from a single, a single singularity, a single point in space-time for no reason. You give me that one, and I'll tell you what ha everything else that happened after that. But you got to give me that one, you know? And I have some bridges to sell you, you know? <laughs> so, you know, there's, a, there's no underlying intelligence in nature. Nature is dead, that's what this worldview is about. Nature is dead. It's a dead thing. It's a mechanized machine that is there for no reason. Okay? There's no such thing as the spirit at all. No such thing as spiritual dimension. No such thing as natural law, certainly. Because for, for one to accept natural law, well, where does it come from? You know, I, I ask people like whether they accept that natural law exists or that, you know, there's actual objective truth and morality and like two-thirds of people don't believe don't accept it they don't believe that it exists they don't think there is objective reality and objective truth and objective morality you know they think it's all relative and we get to make it up I've actually done a, a psychological uh, small psychological profiling or study you know uh, just asking people this question at random and collecting results and analyzing them we're at about two-thirds of people who are moral relativists and believe that truth is relative also, that it's not objective, okay? Now, you ask the same people, do you believe in karma? 88, almost 90% of people believe karma is real and it exists. So I, I, I'm like, I can't believe this. You, you're going to tell me that there's no such thing as a difference, real difference between right and wrong. Human, there are constructs in the human mind is what they think. Right? And simultaneously holding in their mind the idea that karma exists. Well, I, I asked them the question, what put karma in place then? You believe it exists. What force created it? What made it? What put it in place? And they have no answer for that. You know, They intuitively believe karma exists but can't answer where did it come from because that would involve a creator. And somebody in left brain imbalance can't acknowledge that. You know, So... To a left brain imbalanced person, there's no such thing as spiritual or natural law. It doesn't exist. Uh, as a matter of fact, all of existence has no purpose other than to continue its existence. See, survival is the highest aspiration to a left brain imbalanced individual. Right and wrong have no bearing. There's, there's no point in even discussing it. Okay? Because right's what's right for me if I'm super left brain imbalanced. Wrong is whatever affects me negatively. Okay? It doesn't matter what's actually moral. Okay? It's all subjective to a left brain imbalanced individual. And to them, nothing has any purpose. 
Since it's all a grand cosmic accident, how could there be a purpose for existence? Without a creator, who's going to create the purpose for it? You know? So it has no purpose other than to continue surviving. And again, that's right there is proof they're in the R complex, they're in the base brain. Survival is the highest goal. Survival is the only aspiration. Now, in Satanism, it's about as left brain imbalanced as it gets, folks. You know what their number one law is? Survival. Survival is the highest law. Okay, and we hear about this in Darwinism, too. The ultimate purpose of the being is to continue to survive. I would highly debate that. I would highly disagree with that. There, is, there are laws higher than survival. Okay, But in Satanism, they simply refer to it as self-preservation. And that means preservation of systems of belief as well. Systems that are serving the self, the egoic self, they must continue to survive. Self-preservation as the highest law. That's, what's, that's the number one tenet of Satanism. And it doesn't matter who you need to step on to do it, who you need to step on to get one up on somebody else. This is extreme left brain imbalance worldview. All of these characteristics in the randomness worldview are hallmarks of scientism, atheism, totalitarianism, and dark occultism. You could add to that list. You know, whether you refer to it as Satanism, dark Luciferianism, it doesn't make a difference. It's the hallmarks of the dark occult. On the other side, on the right brain imbalance side of the worldview, there's another worldview called determinism. Okay, determinism is based in right brain imbalance and is defined by, in general, helplessness, religiosity, and the dismissal of free will. This worldview will eventually lead to a society of blind order followers and willing slaves who accept their conditions as their lot in life. So, hallmarks of deterministic worldview. God controls every event in creation. Nothing happens at random. There is no free will. So, so you can never throw anything a curveball through free will. Every event is preordained. Okay? And re religionists believe in this. See, I, I like to say, my presentation is going to piss everybody off. And that's what it should do. Because if, if you're in one of these forms of belief systems, it's, it represents one form of imbalance or another. So people who believe in government and science are in that left brain imbalance. They're going to get pissed off that I'm talking about that form of imbalance. And then the people who are in religion and the New Age movement, they're in that right form of imbalance, so they're going to get pissed off at that. Good. Let them all be pissed off. <laughs> the truth will piss you off, and then it will set you free if you accept it. So, you know, all occurrences are preordained. Free will is an illusion. Now, you know who just said this in his latest book? Stephen Hawking who you would think is the most left brain person that you could think worships at the altar of scientism, believes the universe is a grand accident, okay, and a mechanized machine, okay. He, it's like, it's like this comes full circle. It feeds off of each other like a feedback loop, these forms of imbalance. He went so far through left brain imbalance, he's so in the left brain, that he actually developed the hallmark of right brain imbalance, which is that there's no such thing as free will. No such thing. Since it's all a mechanized machine and there's no consciousness, there can actually be no choice. We are actually robots controlled by matter. Hawking believes this. He actually wrote this in his book. He said free will is as dead as God. Okay? And pe millions of people buy this moron's books, and I'll call him a moron right to his face. There's not a drop of intelligence in that man, and people think he's one of the most intelligent people in the world. You might be one of the most overly intellectual people in the world, but you have no wisdom at all. Zero, if that's how you think. And again, put him in front of me and I'll tell it to him to his face. Okay? Because these pe people actually believe he's smart. That person isn't smart. He's dumb. He's intellectual, but that doesn't make you intelligent. Okay? He has no part of the big picture. None. Just because you can theorize something and, and visualize it and calculate it mathematically does not make you an intelligent person. That means you're great at using the intellect. You're great at mathematics. You're great at linear and logical thinking. That does not make you wise. All right? So 
you know, this, uh, to, to continue with the right-brained, imbalanced worldview, since God controls everything in creation, nothing is possible to change. Human beings are powerless to create change. Everything is being made to be this way by God. This is what religionists and right brain imbalanced people think. So, therefore, why take any action? Action is ultimately meaningless. A big hallmark of the New Age community, because it's a religion. You know, the Course in Miracles. Oh, we just need to accept everything the way that it is, right, folks? Doesn't make a difference if evil is running amok in our midst. No, accept it all. Don't try to change a damn thing. Take no action, just observe and see how far deeper that gets you into bondage. Because that's the best way to get real deeper into chains. Okay? So these are all hallmarks of religious extremism and what I call simply slave think. Because that's what it is. Let's not euphemize anything. Let's call them what it really is. This is master think, that's slave think. And if you want a world that continues to propagate slavery, you'll stay in one of those forms of brain imbalance. And this right brain imbalance, in, in addition to religious extremism and slave think, is the hallmark of the New Age movement and their followers, their religious followers. Now, there's a balance that is struck between these, okay? And that's what everything really is ultimately about, creating a balance. Because there are components to these two worldviews that if they come together, it shows, it shows us what the truth is. And here it is right in the middle here. There is a deterministic component to reality. And there is a random component to reality existing in cooperation with each other, in conjunction with each other. The deterministic component is what I'm talking about here today and referring to under the banner of natural law. That is determined. It is law. It is set. You're not changing it. It works that way flawlessly 100% of the time. That's determined. Natural law is determined. Okay? It's the deterministic component to reality. Then there is a randomness component to reality that works continuously in conjunction with natural law. And this is called, this is a little thing called free will. Our ability to choose our behaviors, to do certain things and to not choose to do certain things. And we have it. Every individual has it, no matter what position, no matter what situation they're in. I don't care what institution you're in. I don't care what, who you've listened to up to this point. I don't care what background you come from. I don't care what economic class you come from. Every single solitary being that is capable of thinking at all is gifted with free will. You have free will to choose your behaviors, and so does every other human being. Everyone. Okay? It's a gift of creation itself. Okay? We can choose what we will do and not do. Nobody can actually make anybody do something like a robot. Oh, believe me, there's people who are trying. You know? Like Art talked about, Jose Delgado was searching for means to electronically, directly control through chip implants and stimulus through chip implants in the brain, human behavior, like a robot, to put a technology into the brain to control the behavior of the individual. And that went on right here. This is where that took place, folks, right on Yale's campus, okay? Read, read some of his stuff. You want to be disturbed? You think what I'm telling you is somewhat disturbing. Read some of Delgado's material. He was telling people, we're going to show you that free will doesn't exist. We're going to show you there's no such thing as rights, that we make up what rights are. The ruling class makes up what a right or, and a wrong is. We tell you what it is, and you have no choice. And he was telling you, we're going to show you you have no rights, that you're our slaves. Yeah, read some of his material. And an excellent book Art recommended too, uh, uh, Jim Keith, Mass, Con uh, Mass Control, The Engineering of Human Consciousness. If you haven't read that book, get it and read it. And that's just an introduction. And many people think he was murdered over it. You know, so uh, truth lies in the middle of these worldviews. There's a deterministic component called natural law. There's a random component called free will, our ability to choose our behavior freely. So let's look at 
this debate that's been going on since time immemorial of human nature versus human nurture. And again, I'm getting ready to piss everybody off, okay? Um, this debate's been going on forever. Wh which is it? What's human nature really look like? What's its, what's its essence? Is it angelic or demonic? Okay? I would say it's neither. It's neither one of these things. It's not, it's not both. It's neither. So nobody wins here, you know, who, who falls on one side or the other. And it's a very difficult thing for people to accept as well. Because when we ask the question, what is the nature of a human being? It's a very similar question to asking, what is the nature of this computer up on this platform? What is the nature of that projector? What is the nature of those cameras? Well, is there, can I actually say what a nature, what the nature of these things is? It's a computer. Its nature is to compute information. What is the nature of that projector? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it angelic? Is it demonic? Is that projector demonic? No. Its nature is that it projects imagery. What is the nature of these cameras? They capture imagery. That's all. So what's the nature of a human being? The nature of a human being is that it takes in information, it processes it, and then it outputs it through behavior. And as we're going to see, that's very much like a computer. I'm not saying that it is a computer. I'm saying it's like one. Okay? So human nature is neither inherently good nor inherently evil, as many people think fall on one side of this argument or the other. Instead, we should consider the operating conditions or the environment in which human beings exist, which influence, influences behavior to a great extent, thus creating the current human condition. That's why it's called the human condition. It's not called, the situation we're in is called the human condition. It's not called the human nature, okay? It's called the human condition. There's a reason it's called a condition. For any condition to be in place, well, hey, what condition is my computer in right now? What condition is my projector in? What position is Richard's cameras in? They're in operating conditions. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing because they've been kept up in good condition. Okay, in the example of my computer, it has a working operating system without malware on it. Okay, it has software that does the job that does what I'm asking it to do properly without bugs, okay? Those are the conditions. The operating conditions will determine how does it perform? What kind of output can it put out into the world, all right? So, again, what I'm saying here is that human beings are like computers, not that they are computers. Let me just state that emphatically. We're not computers. We're like computers, Okay? We are programmable. That's the nature of a human being. How many people have ever heard anybody say that the nature of a human being is that a human being is programmable? Uh, to my knowledge, I'm the only person or researcher that is calling that human nature. Our nature is that we can be programmed. And there's another thing, that's another thing people don't want to hear. They don't want to hear this because, it, they, again, they liken it to a mechanized machine. And I'm not saying, again, I, to emphasize, I'm not saying we are computers. I'm saying we're like them in the ways that we can be programmed. So what gets put into a person through the environment, which is called the culture, all right, and becomes their programming, determines what they will output onto the screen, which is called human life. And that will create the human condition in the aggregate as more and more people operate that way. All right, so let's look at how this works. Human beings are programmable much like computers. Like a computer, if a human being has a bad file system format, that's the first thing you do when you're going to get ready to use a computer. You have to format the drive. How many people here are somewhat techy? Not many. Okay, about a quarter to a third. All right. So some people will know what I'm talking about here. For the others, excuse the jargon for a moment. All right, I'll explain what it is. A file system format is you got to format the hard drive so you can prepare it for a specific operating system. 
which is basically the task controllers. It's going to control what happens on the computer, what pro how programs get launched, how memory is used, etc. In a nutshell, all right. I, I do this for a living, so you know I know all the technical stuff. I'll, I'll, so I'll try to keep it simple. So. If the human being has a fed, bad file system format, right? This is akin to the operating conditions during a child's formative years, the first six years of their life, essentially. Now, think about it. We call this their formative years, their formative years, like a format on a hard drive, because this is what puts the file system into the human being that prepares it for its operating system, okay? So, largely, what programs the child at this stage is the parents, and what they will see in their immediate environment at home and during their very early years in, quote, schooling, all right? Now, if, like a computer, if a human being also has bad, a bad operating system, now this is like Mac OS, Windows, Linux, uh, ex you know, et cetera, uh, Android, iOS, these are operating systems. Again, they are basically providing a platform that other programs will run in, and they're providing a graphical user interface. This is your culture. The operating system is the culture in which the programs run, okay? So let's say if you have a bad operating system, meaning you're already surrounded in a bad environment, in a bad culture, right? That's also going to negatively impact the output. And then they have bad software programs. Now, these are the programs that you run. Now, if I didn't have a good presentation uh, software, piece of software, my presentation might come out sloppy. It might crash in the middle of it. It, it might not display the graphics or the text properly. Okay? So you got to make sure you're working with good, reliable software as well. Now, what the software is, is the belief systems. What the person has taken into the mind and is processed and made part of themselves. And th now, if all of those things are bad, we have three bad components. The format is bad, the file system format, which is the formative years of the child, okay? The culture is bad, meaning they're already growing up in a bad culture or in a con culture that condones moral relativism, etc., and doesn't understand natural law. And the software programs that have been input into the child are bad, meaning their belief systems, okay? What do you think the output of that, quote, computer is going to be like? Is it going to be good? Is it going to be chaotic? If I screw up my system's hard drive format, if I put an operating system that is like at alpha state and it's not ready for prime time because the development's not finished, it's half-baked, okay? And then I load crappy software that's full of bugs and the developers didn't really care about programming them correctly, do you think that computer is going to operate properly and give me the output on the screen I'm looking for or output on the printout I'm looking for or output on the internet that I'm looking for? Good luck. <laughs> if you know a little bit about computers, you're, you're laughing now because it would be ridiculous to assume that it could do that. Well, why do we think that we're going to have that in our environment when all of these things are badly programmed? See, the output onto the screen is also going to be horrible if all those three things you know, that determine how the, the, the system works are also bad. So it will continue, it will contribute to deteriorating conditions on a mass scale. Like a computer, the behavior of a human being largely depends upon its programming. And its programming is the quality of the information that is being input into it. The quality of the information it's taking in. The quality of the information t it's taking in is going to determine the quality of the information it's outputting, like any other computer. So if garbage goes in, surprise, garbage is going to come out. If good information goes in, quality goes in, quality will come out, and the output will be as one wants it to be. It will be able to process and create efficiently, effectively, not chaotically. We gain knowledge which is the acceptance of truth. Since love opens us up to truth, knowledge is its reception. It is the receiving of truth. We come to know, okay? So that's how it starts. I call this the initiating expression. Now, of course, there's a negative 
initiating expression if we are existing in the vibratory dynamic of fear. That would be the opposite of knowledge. What is it? Ignorance. Ignorance. Right. Okay, now, this is what I put forward as knowledge. This is my imagery for knowledge. Okay? Uh, that's a being who knows themselves. You know, and as the mystery traditions of, uh, of Greece put forward uh, at the Delphic Oracle, know the self and you will know the universe. In other words, know the microcosm and you will know the macrocosm. Know thyself. The positive aspect of this initiating expression is knowledge or the acceptance of truth. Knowledge positively influences the quality of our lives because it positively influences our decision-making processes that lead to understanding in every area of our lives. You want to know how something works and ultimately create something good? You have to have knowledge. You want to know how a car works? Keep it running in good order, you have to have knowledge. You want to know how a computer works? Keep it running in good order, you have to have knowledge. You want to know how the human psyche works and keep it running in good, good order so the conditions on earth manifest the way you want them to manifest? You got to have knowledge. Not getting out of this condition without learning. Learning is the key, it's the answer. That, it, knowledge is, is the answer. And people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear it. They want to think, we're magically going to manifest the, con the de desired conditions that we say we want without learning a thing. It doesn't work that way. Morality, it's not right versus left. It's about right versus wrong. This whole left-right paradigm that people are, oh, you fall in with, with the left, with the Democrats or the right, the Republicans, has nothing to do with any of that. It's a false paradigm. The, the thing that all of that's a distraction for not getting you to pay attention to and understand is the difference, the real, true, and objective difference between right and wrong. And we're going to explore what that is, because it can be known. It can be known, and most people will be shocked and horrified to understand the real differences between right and wrong, because they'll have to look into themselves and recognize in many ways that they are cooperating with wrong and that they don't really truly know the difference between right and wrong. When you tell people this, I'm telling you, I told this to somebody in a bar once, which was a big mistake of even trying to bring up this, this discussion in that environment. But occasionally I even, you know, make asinine mistakes like that and think I'm going to be talking to even a semi-conscious being when you're talking to a block, okay? so. I said, you understand what actual morality is, is true common sense. We're going to look at that term, common sense, and explore what it really means. And she said, so what you're saying is if I think that there's no really objective right and wrong, that I don't have common sense. And I said, yes, that's what it, no. I said, that's not what I think. I'm trying to explain to you that's what it means by definition, not by what I think. The definition of common sense is to truly know the difference between right and wrong. And I said, you're, uh, because I say that you are, are not fully in that state of awareness, don't even take it personally because m billions of people on the earth are in that same state of awareness. You're, you're not special and it's not a, a personal attack against you. And I thought this person was going to throw a glass at me. <laughs> Literally got so enraged because... She's associating the concept of common sense with that you are functional and can adequately perform the daily activities of living. And that's not what I'm talking about as common sense, okay? Having common sense about, oh, well, I can eat, prepare my meals and eat for myself and wash my own clothes and, you know, go to work. That's not what I'm talking about as common sense. That's your every man's definition or connotation of common sense, we're going to talk about what common sense really is. Okay? A deep understanding of morality, which are the principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong behavior, lies at the very heart of natural law. This is the essence of it, folks, right here. And here's the difference between right and wrong, in a nutshell, about as simply as I am capable of describing it. All right? Now, we use the words correct or to, right to mean correct and moral. When you say, okay, what's 5 plus 5? It's 10. You're right. 
Meaning, you are correct. That is true. That is the correct answer. That is right. Okay? And then we say, was, was uh, stealing from, was stealing that money from Jim, was that, was that right? To mean, was it a moral behavior? So now, wh why would we use the same word, again, like the ancient Romans used the same word, book and free, Okay, the, the, those two different concepts were represented by the same word, liber, right? And there's a reason, because reading will put you on the path to true freedom if you read the right books, okay? Why would in English, in the English language, we not really, we have other words to mean the same concepts, but the word right means two things simultaneously. It means both correct and it means moral. There's a reason because they mean the same thing. Correct is moral. Correct meaning that is it is in alignment with that which is true, means literally by definition, if it is true, then it is moral. The more you are following something that is false, that is not based in truth, the more you are going down the path of immorality, of wrongdoing. So we have to come to know what is true regarding right and wrong if we are going to be able to correctly, with wisdom, choose between these two modalities of behavior. So right, again, it means both correct, which is based in truth, and moral, which means that the action, if taken, if acted upon, is in harmony with natural law. Actions based in it do not result in harm to other sentient beings. That's the definition of right. Now look at how simple that, that definition is. And, and think about it for a moment. We're talking about what is a right? Meaning what do you have a right to do? And what you have a right to do is no different than what I have a right to do. What I'm telling you here is every single human being on this planet has the exact same rights. Not one person has one more right than another being. Not one person has one less right than another being. To think that anybody has more or less rights anywhere on the earth at any time in history is a fallacy. It is a lie. It is a deception. It is wrong. It is not correct. It is not based in truth. Rights are universal and the exact same for every human being. Blanket statement, absolute truth. Let the ego chew on it and deal with it. Okay? And again, the ego will have a hard time with this in many cases, with many people. They'll hear that and they'll want to throw a glass at me. So look at the definition again. A right... So when you, when you make a definition, right, this is a noun, right? Noun's a person, place, or thing in the English language. We're talking about a noun here. You look up the word right, it's a noun, meaning a right. A right that we have to enact, to take, is an action. You have to start a definition with the same type of word. You, you're defining a noun, you've got to give it a noun to start the definition, a right is an action. Most people will never even be able to tell you that. They'll say, can you define what a right is to me? They will not give you this noun. A right is an action. So is a wrong an action. A right is an action that if you take it, it does not cause harm to other sentient beings. That's the simple and easiest definition that anybody can give for what a right is. And I guarantee you, you go and engage as many people as you want on the street I have not asked this question and had anybody raise, ever raise their hand or even contact me later and say, you go up to somebody on the street and ask them if they can define what a right is. Nobody can give you the correct definition for what a right is. Now, if you don't know what the definition of a right is, you certainly don't know whether you're choosing accurately between a right and a wrong, between right and wrong behavior. You can't. It's not possible. So 
so many people believe that they're allowed and they can do actions with no consequence that actually aren't in alignment with natural law because the taking of those actions do result in harm. And they don't really even understand that. So let's look at what a wrong is. We're going to deeply look into what a wrong is. We're going to focus on what wrongs are. Because in reality, to even start this, right, what have we based this definition on? Actions based in it do not result in harm, right? That's the negative of another definition. Well, it's the negative of this definition. So you can only actually define a right by knowing what a wrong is. A right technically cannot be defined outside of the negative. A right can only be defined apophatically, meaning understanding what a wrong is and then stating that it is anything that falls outside of the parameters of wrongdoing. Okay, and we're going to get to what those parameters are. All right? So, I'm sorry, I, I want to focus on wrong for a moment. Okay? Wrong, again, we say this, what's five plus five? Nine. Wrong. It's not true. Incorrect. Incorrect answer. It's not based in truth. We use the term wrong to mean both incorrect and immoral. Well, that was wrong what you did to, to that person by hitting him for no reason. You didn't have the right to do that. Immoral means in opposition to natural law. Because actions that are based in it result in harm to other sentient beings. That's the simple definition of a wrong. Now, we can go... We can go deeper into the definition of what a wrong is and look at different types of wrongs, which is what I'm going to do. What we're really talking about here is common sense. That's what conscience is. People don't think of conscience as common sense. You know, they don't think of conscience as knowledge. Conscience is knowledge. It's not action. It's not behavior. It's knowledge. Again, knowledge is the way out of this. Okay, And this is the knowledge that has to be developed. Conscience comes from the Latin prefix con, meaning together, and the Latin verb sciere, meaning to know or to understand. You put them together, to know together, to understand together. Conscience is common sense. Common sense knowing. Common sense knowledge. Literally, from the etymological breakdown of the word. Con together, science to know. That's why the problem is people don't have common sense. That's why I'm sitting there almost laughing hysterically that I need, I need to try to teach common sense to people. The ridiculousness of it. Now, what we all need to be doing is doing that work. You know, I know you guys get a lot of this. We need to start reaching out to other people. Well, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Conscience, the definition of it, is the definitive knowledge of the objective difference between right and wrong according to natural law. Objective. Definitive. Okay, it's not up for debate. It exists inherently and objectively. It can be understood, known, discovered. This is different from action. Conscience is the knowledge. Then we act upon it. Okay? So it's different from understanding something and acting upon it. Right? To have conscience is to have common sense. It's to know the difference between right and wrong and understand that difference deeply. Then we're going to convert that into action. We exercise conscience. The exercise of conscience is actually action. The exercise of conscience is the free will choice of right action over wrong action once the definitive knowledge of the objective difference between right and wrong according to natural law has been acquired and integrated into the being. We acquire that knowledge first, understand it, then we act in either accordance with it or disharmony with it. If we act in accordance with it, it's called the exercise of conscience. That's action. Natural law versus man's law or government. Here's the differences. Natural law is based upon the principles. It's based upon principles and truth, meaning things that are inherent to creation are not made by humankind. Natural law can only either be harmonized with due to knowledge and understanding or rejected due to ignorance. So it's not, it's not something that is based on compliance because of 
we fear the punishment that would result of not understanding it. Okay, if you don't understand it and live according to it, the result is inescapable because men and women are not actually creating the result, okay? The universe is bringing that result to us intelligently and dynamically, all right? In other words, once again, this is about consequences. You behave a certain way, there's certain consequences. You change the behavior, you'll change the consequential results. Natural law is universal, which means that it exists and applies anywhere in the universe regardless of physical location. There is no place you can go in the physical universe to escape natural law. Let me know if you find a way out of this universe and into another where natural law no longer applies, and uh, you know we'll take a look at it together. But until you figure out the way out of this universe and into a place that's not governed by law, you're bound by natural law. Okay? Natural law is eternal. It, it will exist for as long as the universe exists, and it is immutable. Exists and applies for as long as the universe exists and cannot be changed by anything humanity is capable of doing or any other species in the universe is capable of doing for that matter. Man's law, on the other hand, let's look at how this contrasts with natural law. It's not based on principles and truth. It's based on dogmatic beliefs that are programs that are running in the human mind. These are constructs of the mind that operate like programs. Nat uh, man's law is complied with due to the fear of the punishment that will be conducted upon people who attempt to not comply with it. It's most of the only reason people ever comply with the law of man. And that's a very low state of consciousness, fear. That really is only going to get you all the negative things that we say we don't want if we're in that vibration. Man's law differs with location based upon the whim of legislators, like prohibition. Well, I'm allowed to smoke marijuana in one state, and then I could be jailed for it in another. My freedom could be taken if I cross this imaginary line. Okay, I'm, I'm a gun owner, okay? If I, take one, if I take certain weapons that I own across an imaginary line, I could be jailed for years. But over this side of the imaginary line, it's okay. And you're just exercising a right. Hey, over here, it's morally wrong. We'll, we'll cage you for it. Over here, yeah, you're allowed to do that. You can have that high-capacity magazine. But over here, you're going into a cage for it just by crossing an imagine, imaginary barrier called a state border. And people think that makes sense. They think the moral relativism of man's law makes sense. They actually believe something can be moral in one place and immoral in another place. You know? That's cognitive dissonance. That's holding two contradictory notions in the mind simultaneously and accepting them both when they're clear contradictions with each other. It's called lying to yourself. Let's be honest about what it really is. It's called lying to yourself. Man's law changes with time based upon the whim of legislators, which is also moral relativism. Prohibition in the 1920s. Well, it was legal to possess and consume alcohol, then for years it became illegal to do so. Then it switched back to becoming magically moral again. We won't cage you for doing it. Well, it changes over time based on our preferences and likes and dislikes. Yeah, we get to make up what law is, what right and wrong are. It's called moral relativism. All right? And it's one of the tenets of Satanism. Thomas Jefferson said a free people claim their rights as derived from the laws of nature, and this was also embedded in the Declaration of Independence. The laws of nature and of nature's God, and not as the gift of their magistrates. John Locke said, the natural liberty of man is to be free from any superior power on earth and not to be under the will or legislative authority of man, but only to have the law of nature for his rule. Former Grand Master of the Order of the Rose Cross, the Rosicrucian tradition, Francis Bacon, said, nature, to be commanded, must first be obeyed. If we want the forces of the cosmos on our side, we have to learn and adhere to the principles of natural law. If we do not align our behavior to that, 
nature will not stand with us. It will continuously stand against us, and it will itself create more strife and suffering in our lives. Thank you.